Today's webinar was made possible by our platform sponsor, Firespring. Kirsten Hill is the Director of Nonprofit Solutions at Firespring. She's a Nebraska native, born and was raised in North Platte. She graduated from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln with almost two decades in nonprofit management and fundraising. She has raised over 20 million for Nebraska nonprofit organizations and worked to better train and equip nonprofit leaders and boards of directors. She frequently speaks to nonprofit groups and other organizations about fundraising, board development, and organizational change. Welcome, Kristen. Go ahead and take it away. All right, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Uh, Delaney, can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. We, we were having, I was having a little audio issue earlier, so just wanna make sure that is working. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, there we go. You guys should be able to see that. I am thrilled to be with everyone today and be able to present one of my absolute favorite topics. Um, I love talking to people about overcoming the overhead myth and how you can budget and really position your organization for uh, effective marketing and effective growth. So uh, Delaney, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, you already know who I am. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about Firespring. Firespring is located in Lincoln, Nebraska. We are right in the middle of everywhere. This is the heart of what we call the Silicon Prairie. Firespring provides strategic guidance that is activated through creative marketing, printing, and technology solutions. We do all of that to help businesses and nonprofits prosper. We are also Nebraska's first certified B Corporation. And what that really means is that we walk the talk. We understand the unique challenges and responsibilities that nonprofits and businesses face. And we really embrace a high level of accountability and transparency and provide ourselves a, and pride ourselves on being good stewards to the community. We do that through what we call the power of three. Firespring donates 1% of our profits, so the top line revenue is donated to nonprofit organizations. 2% of our products is donated through in-kind um, products and service donation, and 3% of our people. So every full-time employee at Firespring, folks just like me, uh, are given one full day every month, eight hours um, on the Firespring dime, so to speak, to volunteer uh, and to work with the nonprofit charities of our choice. So again, absolutely walking the talk. Uh, today, we are going to talk about overcoming the overhead myth, again, a topic I'm really passionate about. We're going to briefly talk about what is the overhead myth um, and why does it matter? Uh, what is the impact of under investing in our organizations? How do you address the concerns of the overhead myth with donors? How do you position it? How do you talk about it? We're gonna talk about what marketing efforts uh, provide the best return on investment that will really help you move the needle for your organization, how to improve the budgeting process, specifically with this overhead myth in mind. And then finally, we will make sure that you have some action steps uh, and uh, we'll hopefully leave just a couple of minutes for question and answer. If you happen to be uh, on Twitter and you really like tweeting, uh, I would recommend using the hashtag powered by purpose and you can find us at Firespring. So we are jumping right into what is the overhead myth. In 2013, uh, this gentleman, his name is Dan Pallada. Dan was the founder of an organization called the Charity Defense Council. And in 2013, he gave a TED Talk. Uh, and the subject of that TED Talk was the way that we think about charities is dead wrong. And when Dan gave this talk, the entire nonprofit sector cheered. Yay! Like it was, it was this breath of fresh air, this conversation that we had been having internally for years, but no one had put it really into words um, that we that we could share with the general public. Um, we being nonprofits could share with the general public and that people could really understand. Um, and what he said is that there is this myth about overhead spending and administrative spending. And the idea that you can reasonably evaluate a nonprofit's performance um, or their trustworthiness by only looking at how much they spend or don't spend on overhead is a complete myth. 
Uh, and, and what overhead is, is it includes operating, administrative expenses, technology expenses, uh, expenses that are not directly related to uh, the programmatic operations of your organization. So it includes fundraising expense as well. Um, and the re and I really believe that this, um, this development of the overhead myth, it is a reaction um, to uh, some sort of scandals that happened in the industry, in the nonprofit uh, industry in the 1990s. Um, and instead of taking those instances as what they were, which is outliers, donors instead painted all nonprofits with this really wide brush and they started to crack down using overhead as the means for evaluating the success of nonprofits. And let's be honest, as nonprofits, we have somewhat leaned in to that messaging just by touting how low our overhead is. And we sort of wear it like this badge of honor uh, that our overhead is low as opposed to finding ways uh, to correct the messaging in general. And, and somehow the overhead myth is as though the dollars that support your infrastructure, the dollars that support and uphold the, the very foundation of your organization don't also support your mission, which is completely wrong. Um, the, the, the money that you invest in your organization ultimately improves your mission significantly. Um, and, and the overhead myth completely discounts that. Um, especially now, if you think about what's happened in the last uh, sev you know, year or more uh, with, with the pandemic, how could any of us have existed as organizations without technology? And technology um, platforms, Zoom, uh, ways that you can communicate with donors and clients um, and, and other team members, that's been critical. But uh, it would all be considered overhead uh, according, uh, according to the way that we file our, our, our taxes and our, and our audits. So uh, what happened as a result of Dan Pilata's talk in 2013 is that there were three organizations that came together and they wrote two open letters. One was a letter to nonprofits and the other was a letter to donors. Uh, it was the Better Business Bureau, GuideStar, and Charity Navigator. Those three entities basically said, sorry, we kind of messed up. Um, they apologized for their role in perpetuating what was at that time then deemed the overhead myth. And they said, really sorry, uh, which was great. Um, and again, the sector sort of cheered, but it still didn't really trickle down into public perception. So 62% of Americans still believe that the typical charity spends more than it should on overhead. And most people don't understand nonprofits and they definitely don't understand nonprofit accounting. So while this overhead myth, you know, in 2013, there was this big wave, this momentum talking about overhead and how it's not a bad thing. And, you know, really sorry that we told you it was, um, that was something that really resonated with the sector, but didn't necessarily trickle down to the general public. In fact, um, there, there are some new statistics here. So, 37% of nonprofits who uh, who report private receiving private contributions of fifty thousand dollars or more reported that they had no fundraising or special event costs on the 2000 uh, IRS Form 990s. 13% of operating public charities reported spending nothing for management and general expenses. And 75 to 85 percent of these organizations were incorrectly reporting the costs that were associated with grants. These statistics are really scary to me and frankly can't be true um, because there is no way that you can run an organization, even the smallest of organizations, without having some expense um, for operating that organization. Um, and it shows really that the overhead myth is, is still um, something that is perpetuating uh, in, in, our, in our society. So under investing in overhead impacts your organization. It impacts, it impacts it significantly, primarily in your ability to deliver on your mission and your ability to sustain your organization long-term. 
And it is critical that nonprofit leaders, boards of directors, funders, and general communities start to understand this and really internalize this fact that you don't want to underinvest in your organization. And it's something that our staffs, our staffs and, and our entire organizations ultimately want to make sure that we are appropriately investing in our organizations so that we're not undermining the mission and those that we serve. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Vu Lee, uh, or if you are familiar with Vu Lee, he runs an absolutely fantastic uh, nonprofit website called Nonprofit AF. He sends a weekly uh, email out and really is talking about some of the biggest issues impacting the nonprofit sector as a whole. Uh, and if if you haven't had a chance to take a look at, at the stuff that Vu puts out, you definitely need to do that. Uh, basically, what he says is that it is easier to look at overhead than it is to truly understand an organization. Um, so evaluating overhead this and this is not Vu's opinion. This is my opinion. Evaluating overhead also keeps the funder in a position of power. And it allows everyone else that is out there in the community to mistakenly think that they know more about the management of your organization or the management of nonprofits than the leaderships do. And most funders don't like the discomfort of not being the smartest person in the room. So they are going to hold on to these facts that they understand. Uh, and, and Vu then goes on to say that overhead is really an illusion and it avoids the much harder work of measuring community benefit. Um, and, and when you look at, you know, old philosophies or old ways of measurement like overhead, what you're really doing is you're wasting time. You're distracting from the actual work that needs to be done. You're hampering the ability of nonprofits to adapt and you're preventing innovation you're burning people out and ultimately the entire system of evaluating an organization based only on overhead is very inequitable uh and so it, it's just i i really hope that you guys are are seeing um how sort of um dangerous really uh this overhead myth is to the entire sector so what are the consequences of underinvesting in our organizations? Uh, when we don't put enough money into the infrastructure, the solid foundation of our organizations, what are the consequences of that? First of all, if you have, uh, you may limit or have no staff admin roles. And as a result, you're limiting the ability of your organization to manage and monitor your finances and to adequately tackle fundraising and development. Uh, when you are limiting the amount of money that you're spending in overhead, you're also limiting your investment in staff training and development. And that leads to increased turnover. You get uh, staff and employees with stagnant skills. Uh, it's really difficult for internal advancement. Again, just all of that increases employee turnover. Inexperienced staff for the admin roles, if they're not adequately trained, they don't have the, the right amount of support, they don't have ongoing, uh, ongoing training and education, then you're going to get, again, high turnover and really poor work quality. You also have poor IT infrastructure. So when I was uh, at a United Way in central Nebraska uh, back in the early 2000s, I had a computer that I would go into the office in the morning and I would press the start button and I would turn my computer on and then I would go make myself a cup of coffee, um, maybe a piece of toast. I could kind of walk around, straighten the office a little bit. And if I went back to my computer about 10 minutes later, it would finally be started and ready for the day. How inefficient was that? But we didn't want to spend the money on a new computer because of overhead. Right. And so I just look at all of the inefficiencies that we were building into our day because we didn't want to make the investment because of this overhead myth. Uh, poor donor management systems really lead to an inability to track donors. You can't track the progress of your fundraising. Uh, you have an, a limited ability to target uh, fundraising, which, again, makes you less efficient. And poor performance management systems leads, an in, leads to an inability to 
track outcomes or to easily generate reports for grantors. So all of these things that you're doing to save money are actually uh, adding time and frustration to your day um, and making you less efficient, which then means that you're less efficient at doing the work that you that you are doing in your communities. So how can we educate donors and funders about this issue? And let's be honest, even our boards and our staff uh, need, need to be educated about this issue. And we really need to flip the conversations that we're having in organizations uh, and stop looking at spending on our organizations and on investing in our own organizations and in our own staff as a bad thing. And the first way that you do that is by being really upfront and honest and transparent with questions like these. So what are the typical admin costs of your organization? Um, I used to cringe when I would get this question. So I ran, um, I've been involved with United Ways and I also have run like alternative United Ways, Workplace Giving Federations. Um, and there was no question that frustrated me more than what is your overhead expense? Um, and what I would say to that question is, um, our overhead is low, but I wanna tell you about our impact. I wanna tell you about the great work that happens. And if they would really press, then obviously I would answer exactly what our overhead was. But I was always flipping that conversation because I didn't wanna talk about the overhead, I wanted to talk about the impact. Um, and, and overhead really has been viewed so negatively um, in, in the sector. And I think it, having conversations of, with your board and with your staff about why overhead isn't a bad thing, um, that's a really good start uh, to, to changing those conversations. When we can educate one board at a time and then that board member goes out and into their community or back to their jobs and they're talking to people uh, about you know, organizations and funding and why overhead isn't bad, that's how we start to change these conversations on a more permanent basis. And we really need to stop talking about doing more with less because doing more with less doesn't really allow us to do much. And the focus should instead be what is our return on investment and not just the cost, right? So we should encourage instead questions like this. How effective is your organization? How efficiently do you carry out your mission? What are your outcomes? How many lives do you impact? And do you have a vision for the future of your organization? Do you have a vision for long-term growth? You want to flip those negative conversations that are happening about overhead and instead show them what investment is returning for the organization. Um, so here's another way that you can flip the switch. Now, I will say, I do not recommend having giving this analogy to just anyone. So just anyone who asks, this is probably not the analogy that you want to give because it can come off a little bit snarky. Uh, but if you're talking to your board, if you're talking to friends of your organization, or if you're just sitting around uh, the, the dinner table with a, a group of people and you're talking about what you do and you're talking about overhead, then this is, this is the perfect analogy for the right situation. So my analogy for overhead is that if you don't want to spend on overhead for an organization, a nonprofit to run their programs, then I recommend that you go to a fast food restaurant. Today, we're going to pick Wendy's. So I recommend that you go to Wendy's, which um, for those of you who are out of the United States, Wendy's is like a sort of like a McDonald's, almost like a hamburger fast food restaurant. So I recommend that you go to Wendy's and you order a hamburger. But when you order that hamburger, I want you to tell the Wendy's clerk that you only plan to pay for the meat and the bun. You're not going to pay for anything else. You don't want to pay for the mortgage on the building. You don't want to pay for the salary of the cook or the cashier. You don't want to pay for the cash register or this little headset, kind of like the one I have on today, um, that they are using at the drive through You are only going to pay for the meat and, and the bun and not anything else. And I want you to see if you actually get your burger, because I'm guessing you won't. 
right? Because, and there's a reason for that, because every business, every entity who is doing business has a cost to do that business. And nonprofits are no different. But I also tell people that I would challenge anyone to find a for-profit business that uses their dollars as wisely and as judiciously as a nonprofit organization. There is a cost to doing business for every business or organization that is out there. So there really is a truth. There's an overhead truth. And that is that investing wisely in the right areas allows us to reach more people and to create more impact, not to waste more money. It shows how you are strategic. It shows how you're planning. It shows how the best tools um, that you have will help you to do more good. And everything that you're building into the budget should move the needle on the investments that you're making in your community. So what we're going to talk about now is where are some ways that you can invest in your organization that will really help you to move that needle quickly and effectively, and you can start making a case for, for more investments in your overhead and in your administrative costs. So the first is in community cultivation and marketing efforts. And, it, and again, uh, Firespring is a marketing organization. That's, that's what we're, we're all about. And so a lot of my ideas that I'm giving you here are gonna be marketing driven. So community cultivation, um, if, think about email marketing. So donor management, social media marketing, direct mail, anything that's gonna help you to stay in touch with your constituents and is gonna foster better communication and better relationships. You can automate and personalize so many of these efforts if you have the right tools. That in turn is gonna save you time and you're gonna reap benefits for years by investing wisely in good donor relationships and in good marketing and communication um, with, uh, with, your, with your donors and constituents. The next is investing in fundraising tools. So the ability to take online donations is no longer a nice to have, but it is a must have. And beyond that, I think that you should definitely consider your donors giving experience. So do you take your donor to a third party site in order to make a donation? Not only is that cumbersome, but research shows that 50 to 70% of donors will abandon an online donation form when they are redirected to another website to complete that transaction. So really having the ability to take a donation on your site is critical. Uh, I will give you a little, a little tip here. I think number one, the first thing you want to do is to try and find a website where you can take donations through your existing platform. If you absolutely can't afford to make an investment in a new website that allows you to do that, if you are going to take a donor from your website to an offline third party site, you should absolutely tell the donor on your site that that is happening. So let them know you are going to be redirected to a third party site to complete this transaction. Um, you know, let them know that it is coming so that you are giving them confidence uh, in in the fact that uh, that donation, you know, that the donation that they are making is secure. Next is um, search uh, SEO, PPC and SEO. So SEM is search engine marketing. SEO is search engine optimization. Search engine optimization is about driving traffic to your website that's organically through higher search ratings. SEM is search engine marketing. So it includes SEO, but it also increases your visibility through pay-per-click advertising and other advertising that you are running for your organization. Um, SEO and PPC is pay-per-click. So they're a little bit different, but they all have this in common, that they get your website noticed. And you can have the most brilliant website, but if you're not investing in visibility and in driving traffic to your website, then you're going to have this brilliant site that is sitting out there alone on its own. So investing in good SEO, good search engine management, or good search engine marketing and pay-per-click are fantastic investments um, that are considered overhead, but will absolutely drive your bottom line. 
The next is brand updates. Uh, if you think that a nonprofit brand is is something that doesn't matter, like your the logo or the icon, I want you to think about a box of Girl Scout cookies and you think about that green logo that exists or the red cross that you will see on the side of a bus uh, for Bloodmobile. Or if you think about World Wildlife Fund, they have that darling little panda icon. Um, brands are iconic and they should make a statement. And you want everyone in your area to see and recognize your brand as standing for something that is really important in your community. Um, would your supporters want to wear your logo on a shirt? If not, consider an investment in a rebrand. If somebody says, why would you want to invest in a new logo or it is frivolous? Um, I, I think you have to say that branding is one of the most critical pieces and you want people to be able to identify your organization and to know what your organization stands for. Um, if your organization has evolved or changed and your brand no longer reflects um, who you are or what you do, uh, or if people will look at the logo and not know what you do at all, all of those are reasons for investing in a quality brand or in a brand update. And next is your digital presence. Um, and this is really your website. So, uh, you know, how old is your website? Uh, I know my, my son is 13, but sometimes when someone asks me how old he is, I, I want to start at like eight or 10, right? I forget that, that he ages. Websites are a little bit like that. We sometimes forget how old they really are because, you know, you invest in it, you build this site, and then you sort of forget that it's there. Um, but website is really like investing in a physical building. It has to be current. It has to be safe. It should be clean and easy to navigate. People should be able to find what they need when they go to your website. Website is really the same kind of investments that you're making in your office or in your storefront. You don't need to do it every year and you don't have to update things every single year, uh, but it is, it's a one time for now expense, but it is not a one time forever expense. So updating your website and making sure that you have marketing, educational tools, fundraising, mission driven, all of those things for your website is really critical. Um, and how do you know if your website needs an upgrade? So here are eight signs that it is time for a website upgrade. This, uh, this graphic cracks me up. So we're gonna take this, uh, this slow snail and we're gonna, turbo, we're gonna turbo him. So the first way that you know that you're in need of an upgrade is if your site is not responsive. 57% uh, of users say that they will not recommend an organization who has a poorly designed mobile site. And that is not just mobile, but it's really poorly designed site, period. If your site is not up to date, um, folks aren't going to recommend you. And it really is a negative reflection on your organization as a whole. If you're um, responsive design is basically, um, in this case, we're specifically talking about mobile devices. So when someone pulls up your website on a, a screen, they have a full view of your site. If they pull it up on their phone or on their tablet, your site should automatically size down uh, to, to, um, to that mobile um, viewing space. Uh, if your website does not do that, you are not being prioritized on search engine results. Google will only prioritize organizations that have mobile responsive designs. So you wanna make sure that your website is mobile responsive. There are also some additional changes coming from Google. Um, they are, are talking about, they're called Core Web Vitals, and it's all about the user experience. Uh, it is really going to affect uh, organizations and how you are gonna land in search, in search results for Google. So you wanna make sure that your site is responsive, not only for mobile viewing, but for core web vitals. If you have questions about that, contact your website provider, or if you are, are looking maybe for a new website, give us, a, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about that. If your website is outdated, 38% um, of people are going to stop engaging with a website if the content or layout is unattractive. 
Uh, and 75% of consumers will admit to judging an organization's credibility based only on their website design. So if your website was made in 2007 or maybe even 2017, um, or it resembles those eras, then it is probably time for a redesign. You want to make sure that your website reflects your organization, that it reflects your values, your mission, your personality, um, and that it looks current and modern um, and accessible. Uh, if someone goes to your organization and the, the website looks outdated, they are going to assume that everything about your organization is outdated as well. And where is the first place that people go to look for information about anything anymore, it's a website. If your organization does not match your brand, so maybe you've gone through a rebrand recently or you've updated your nonprofit's brand identity, but you didn't update your logo, that is a huge problem. You want to make sure that everything is consistent. So when someone sees your organization in the community or they see your organization online, it is the same. You're presenting the same information, the same brand, um, the same consistency. It is going to look much more professional. Uh, while you don't want to redesign your website all the time, it should reflect where your organization is at in its mission and what your principles are, and you should update the design whenever it's necessary so that it matches your current brand and the current voice uh, for your organization. If your website loads too slowly, you're in trouble. Uh, you actually have eight seconds to capture the attention of those people visiting your site. Uh, so this uh, this image of this blue fish is, I think, supposed to be Dory uh, from Finding Nemo. And Dory is the fish who has short term memory loss. Uh, so basically, if someone comes to your organization and in eight seconds you don't capture their attention, they've forgotten, you know, who you are and what you do. They're going to move on and find another site. They're going to move on and find another organization. Um, so make sure your website loads quickly. If your website has a high bounce rate, meaning someone um, visits your site and then leaves quickly rather than browsing or clicking through to multiple pages. If your organization um, has website analytics, you can actually access your bounce rate. So if you get um, Google Analytics or something like that, you can analyze what your bounce rate is. Uh, the goal is really for your bounce rate to be as low as possible. So if your bounce rate is high, it is probably time to consider a new website. Uh, an engaging, interactive, and interesting website is more likely to draw visitors in um, and invite them to stay for a while and uh, invite them to get involved with your nonprofit organization. Uh, if your nonprofit has a clean, crisp, current site, it's going to do so much more for growing your cause. Uh, if your website fails in any of these categories, um, then uh, then it you know it's it's just not as as effective as it could be. Uh, the next thing is you want, if you have to go through someone else to update your content, um, then you need a new website. So I, I know, you know, gosh, back in the days when I first started with organizations and I was, you know, making sure that we had a website, it was like um, the, the nephew of the board chair who was in high school was creating websites and you could get a site. But then anytime you wanted to make a change to the site, you had to send everything to the high school kid, right? Well, then the high school kid went to college and then you could never reach him and no one could ever update the website. Um, I thought that those days were over, but sadly, I have learned that some organizations are still operating like that. Um, and really, those days need to, to just end. Uh, every organization needs to have the ability to update your own site at a moment's notice. Um, to tie this all back to the, to the overhead discussion, having someone else update your website is horribly inefficient. So if you're having to direct someone else about the changes and then wait for them to make those changes and then go back to make sure that they made the changes correctly, you're wasting time. And it is so much more efficient for you to just be able to go in and make the changes that you need to make um, when you need to make them. And we recommend that you have a minimum of three people on your staff or within your board um, if you don't have the, the right staff folks. Um, you know, bring in a volunteer or a board member, folks who 
you can also train to make updates. So they can make updates when it is relevant. You can do it at the at the click of a button, um, and it's really easy to, to do through um, a content management system. So if your website doesn't allow you to do that, definitely need a new website. If your donors or constituents are going off site for any of these things, so event registration, um, again, making donations, volunteering, uh, if they're, you know, sending, you're sending them off to watch videos on an, on your YouTube channel, but you're not putting those into the, into the, you know, text and into the body of your website, uh, all of those things are, are inefficient. What you want is you want to draw people to your website and be able to offer them everything um, associated with learning about your organizations right there on your site. You don't want to send them off site. Um, when you send visitors away, you're really just wasting all of that effort that it took to drive them to your site. And what you really want is to captivate and engage them and retain them um, and bring them into your organization. And you can't do that if you're driving them to other sites. If your website doesn't talk to your other tools, so if um, if your website doesn't communicate with your um, your you know email marketing platform, or if it doesn't communicate with your your store or your database or whatever it is, um, it, or if it doesn't easily integrate with those uh, with those other things, um, then again, it's time it's time for you to look uh, to look for a new website. Uh, if you are using uh, more than one tool for you know your CRM, your donor database, QuickBooks, all of that stuff, look to see. Uh, all of the ways that you might be able to merge um, some of those uh, some of those skills or technologies. Uh, again, it's all about trying to be more efficient uh, and to make the most use of your donor dollars, not just saving donor dollars in terms of, of overhead costs, but making the most return on investment for those for those donor dollars. Uh, now we're going to talk about five metrics that you can use to measure your fundraising performance. And I'm not going to go through each of these individually. I believe that you're going to get a copy of these slides when uh, the presentation is over. So you can go through and, uh, and evaluate uh, each of these metrics and make sure uh, that these are metrics that you are using within your organization. Uh, what you're really wanting to get at when you're using these metrics to evaluate fundraising performance is how do you know what is working and what your return on investment is the other thing that you want to know is how much money are you okay with spending to make a dollar so would you want to spend 25 cents to make a dollar is are you comfortable with that or do you only want to spend 20 cents to make a dollar uh, the those assessments in terms of, um, you know, your fundraising cost um, versus the amount of money that you're raising, um, those are, are great ways to assess uh, what tools you might want to employ and to make sure um, that you are, um, that you're getting a great return on your investment. So again, here are five metrics to measure your fundraising performance, and you're going to get a copy of that um, with the slides. So the next question that you might have is, OK, great. So you've told me um, that I need to prioritize investing in my organization. So now where do I find the money? Where do I find the money to invest in in my organization in particular in building the capacity for what I do? So the first recommendation is individual donors. So online giving, um, you could do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. You could ask major donors to help invest in, in the infrastructure of your organization. Um, this is asking people to invest. Um, and you don't want to say, you know, invest in the general fund or invest in our administrative costs. You want to say we want you to invest in our organization and in helping us to achieve our mission. And how you're going to do that is by investing in the foundation of what we do and in who we are. 
Next is grants uh, and, and contracts. So uh, you might be able to find local foundations, corporate foundations, family foundations, community foundations who are willing to make investments in your organization. Uh, I have done uh, capacity building grants for a number of organizations that I have been associated with. And really it is all about framing the conversation. And what you're doing is you are making a case for investing in your organization. And once you've invested in your organization, it will allow you to better serve the community and your constituents, et cetera. But there are organizations uh, and individuals who are interested and willing to make investments in your organizations if you make the case for how that will better your community as a whole. Special events. Consider holding a special event that um, the, the funds that come in from those events are not restricted to any specific program, but can be used specifically for the overhead um, and, and administrative costs for your organization. Do you have something that you can offer um, as a fee for service? So um, could you offer a class and, and charge, a, a charge a fee to, to provide that course uh, and then use that money to improve your organization? Could you want to sell t-shirts or tote bags or something else and, and the funds uh, that come back will help you to support just your organization? Uh, think of ways that you might be able to, to enhance the organization um, by, again, in selling or, or, or providing um, fees for services. The next is interest from investments. That's great if you're an organization of a certain size. I recognize that doesn't apply to everyone. Uh, bequests and memorial contributions. I always recommend that unless the donor specifically has said, I want this to go to program XYZ, that you use bequests and memorial contributions to bolster uh, the, the foundation of your organization and to invest in the organization as a whole. Uh, can you offer, again, um, paid training or paid workshops that people will pay you uh, to put on or to uh, organize? Uh, corporate sponsorships, advertisements, affinity partnerships. Can you find uh, folks who are willing to invest in your organization um, and then you're giving them, you know, recognition as a, as a partner? In terms of budgeting, uh, some of this is just really simple, right? You want to make sure that you're using a template for, for budgeting for your organization. You always want to budget your income first, and you want to be both conservative but realistic. I would always um, over budget on uh, what I expected my expenses to be and under budget on what I thought my income would be so that... Um, so that I was making sure that I that I could make everything operate right, um, and then if I had extra money that came in, I would have that five percent cushion, or I would have whatever the cushion is um, if if my income was greater than what I had budgeted. Uh, I would prioritize the non-negotiables. So a great website for me was a non-negotiable. Uh, I had to have a great website, and I would prioritize those things before the variables, like you know extra uh, uh, tchotchkes, like giveaway kind of things. Those were always um, maybe something that um, that I could I could perhaps live without. Uh, if you don't already assign accounting codes to your expenses, got to do that. I don't know who doesn't do that anymore. Uh, align and reconcile your budgeted expenses with your financial statements uh, and make sure that you have an independent person who is looking those over. Uh, break out your expenses and set up your budget by program. Uh, allocate indirect costs like salary, rent, operations, et cetera, your, to your programs. So if your program operations are 75% of what is happening within your organization, um, so, you know, 75% of what you're doing is program related, then 75% of your rent should be allocated to your program. 75% um, of the salaries should be allocated to your program, et cetera. Ask for input from your board or your staff or volunteers. Um, if you need assistance with budgeting, make sure that you are getting buy-in and alignment. 
if possible, set aside a percentage of your income, um, either per year or per month, that you plan to invest back in your organization. So maybe one year you want to invest in new computers for the staff. Maybe the next year you want to invest in a new software. The next year you want to invest in a new website. Every year your budget should have some sort of investment back in your organization that should be budgeted in. And your budget should always match your cash um, at the end of, of, you know, every year, maybe not every month. I understand the cash flows, particularly with nonprofits, ebb and flow. Um, but you want to make sure that you're, you know, definitely meeting the, the payments for your non-negotiables um, and your salaries. So here are some action steps. As an organization, you can or should be focusing on your return of investment, your return on investment instead of the cost of things. So don't look at how much that program costs, but what is the return on investment? Share the overhead myth with your team, with your board, with your supporters, with your friends, with your family, with anybody who will listen, talk about the overhead myth. Explore and evaluate one new potential funding source. If you just do one new funding source every month or you explore one potential new way to fund your overhead um, every quarter even, you're already um, going to make big strides. Leverage a budgeting uh, template to manage your expenses and identify one area to invest back into your organization every year to help you grow your mission. And finally, keep learning. Uh, you can attend more webinars from Firespring or Nonprofit Hub uh, for additional resources. Uh, make sure that you that you are constantly learning and staying on top of what is happening. Uh, if you are feeling buried, I understand this feeling as a nonprofit executive. Uh, you have events and communication and fundraising and IT, and you're probably writing checks and all of that. Um, I really recommend that the first investment that you make is in a good website uh, and let your website do the heavy lifting for you. Let your website dig uh, dig you out, so to speak. At Firespring, we offer a really robust um, package for nonprofit organizations that is incredibly affordable. I will tell you, I came to Firespring as an employee because I was first a client. Uh, the last three nonprofit organizations I've worked for, we installed Firespring websites. Um, they are fantastic. They allow you to do turnkey landing pages, email marketing, event registration, um, content management systems, all of those things. So if you're looking for a new site or looking to really just help you streamline what you're doing, um, take a look at our at our website offerings. We also uh, provide all of these services. So again, websites, marketing, printing, strategic guidance. I'm also a story brand certified guide. So if you're looking to incorporate storytelling in your organization or to clarify your messages, we have all kinds, um, all kinds of ways that you can do that. Um, keep learning with us as well. So firespring.com slash webinars. We have a number of free webinars, but also Nonprofit Hub has incredible resources available to you. And we are so thrilled to be able to partner um, with Nonprofit Hub to provide you with training and education. Uh, Please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, email us at Firespring. Please look me up on LinkedIn. Give me a follow or connect with me as a friend. Happy to visit with you. And now let's see, do we have any questions? I don't know if Delaney uh, is still around. Did you find any good questions in there that might, yes. might be able to answer? Okay. Yeah, Give lots of questions. Me. Yeah, and thank you so much. That was awesome. Sure. Um, so just a few things. Jonathan asked a question about um, bounce rate. And I think that it might have been answered, but just really quickly explain again, in general, what does a high bounce rate mean? And then what, what, if you know, what is an acceptable bounce rate that we should strive to? Sure. So, um, bounce rate means it's the amount of time that someone comes and visits your site and then they leave the site. So if they leave the site quickly, that is a bounce. So it means that they've come to your site, they've seen what you have to offer, and they're out immediately. They're not clicking through to find um, other information. They're not digging any deeper. They're not spending time reading what's on your homepage. They're just looking and bouncing. Uh, high bounce rate, it really is, is can be you know, specific to industry. I would literally just recommend that you Google high bounce rate for 
homeless nonprofit websites or high bounce rate for, um, you know, food pantry websites, whatever your organization is or where, you know, whatever the focus of your organization is, I recommend that you specifically um, Google what the bounce rate is for that, for those kinds of organizations. Um, you definitely don't want anything, you know, 60, 70% bounce rate is way too high and you've got major changes that need to be made um, on your site. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I think this is super interesting, the overhead myth, um, kind of circling back to that concept in general, how do we kind of overcome our own implicit bias about spending? Because I feel like there's probably not a person person here who doesn't kind of have like a visceral gut reaction to spending on anything, um, like especially overhead, but are there ways that we can kind of even just kind of combat ourselves, like when we get that feeling? Well, I think I think the first thing is making yourself aware that you have that implicit bias, right? Making yourself aware that you, and, and I still will catch myself doing it, you know, like, gosh, you, if you, if you, you know, you don't want to spend too much on this because of your overhead or because of your admin costs. Um, and then I always check myself and I say, but wait, what will be the return on investment? Will this increase the efficiencies? Um, will this help me to make my organization better and as a result, my community better? Mm -hmm. And I and then I sort of flip that switch. Um, but I think it's something you just need to constantly be thinking about. And I think it's it's having conversations with um with your board of directors in particular, with your staff, about the fact that investing in your organization is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always recommend that if you're struggling with making that investment, invest in your people first. Um, because investing in your employees by making sure that they have good salaries, making sure that they are paid well, that they are compensated well, that they have, you know, the best benefits that you can possibly provide. Um, I think that is the best way to make an investment in your organization that will that will return your investment tenfold. Um, and and by keeping um, and by keeping folks you know on board, then you're not retraining when they leave, and you have to hire new people. Um, and I think everyone can understand investing in employees. Mm -hmm. Um, we have lots of questions coming in, um, so we might just have a time for a few more, but uh -huh. do you have any recommendations on the best way to evaluate the return on investment for certain programs? You know, I, I think it just, that's a really hard question to answer because everybody's ROI is going to be different depending on mm -hmm. what you're doing, right? So I think... Um, you want to make sure that your organization that you can make a case for for what you're doing right you can make a case for you can justify those expenses you know if you and every organization is different you know there are some organizations that can help a hundred people and there are other organizations that can help 20 but what they're doing for those 20 is different than what they're doing for the 100. Does that make sense? So I think it really is about identifying what, what your organization is designed to do and are you doing it well? Um, there are some metrics that I had given um, that, are, that are in the slide deck that you can look at that will help you analyze a little bit of ROI. Um, but I think, you know, are you, are you serving more people than you served the year before? Um, are you making um, better impact for those individuals and families that you're serving? Um, all of those things are impacts that you're having in the community. And if you can measure the impact that you're having in the community, then it just makes sense that when you're investing in your organization and your organization is solid, then you can continue to help those families and to help, you know, your community be even better. Mm -hmm. Does that answer that? I think, I think that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. And we will be sharing the slide deck um, in the email that we'll send to you guys after today's session. Um, another question was kind of back to the analogy that you used about like the hamburger, like you're only going to pay for the hamburger and not, not like the salaries or anything like that. Um, we have a question about what are some, you know, really like applicable things that we could do to overcome if a funder is not willing to fund overhead expenses? Mm -hmm. I think what 
the way that I have dealt with that in the past is when a funder said, you know, I don't want to invest in overhead. Um, what we did was we really made the case for investing in investing in our organization is investing in our programs. Our organization does not exist separate from the programs that we provide. We are all together. And if I have to constantly retrain staff because I can't pay them enough, then I'm not able to perform the services that I need to be performing and providing the impact that I need to provide in the community. And I think that when a donor asks about your administrative costs, your response should always be, I wanna to talk to you about the impact that our organization has. Then you can follow it up with, with what your admin costs are. You can talk about that. But I think you always want to answer that overhead question, that, that admin cost question. You always want to follow up at, and, and talk instead about your impact. Uh, I think it is reframing the conversation and redirecting the conversation. And in some cases, um, they, again, they're asking that question because they can understand it. It's hard for them to evaluate the effectiveness of your homeless outreach program, but they can evaluate how much money you spend on copy paper, right? Like that's easy for them to understand. So what you have to do instead is to break down and to make your program understandable and to really demonstrate your impact. And then you can talk to them about, about how efficiently you do that. And again, none of this is, is to say that you can go out and be super inefficient. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to be inefficient with donor dollars. Um, but it it is you really didn't hear about that <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It is really about making a case for the fact that investing in your organization is really an investment in your community. It's an investment in your programs, um, and and that's really really critical. Yeah, we do have a few other questions in here, but it is 12 o'clock. So we're going to end the recording and we will try to make sure that um, all the questions get answered before we send a follow up email. Um, so expect to hear from us the questions here. Um, Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. If anybody has questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, on LinkedIn or, or um, you know, just via, via Firespring. Um, and it's been great uh, chatting with everybody. Thank you guys so much for having us. Yes. Thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Um, it has been recorded. We'll email you shortly and please enjoy the rest of your day and see you next time.